exciting to be here. I heard you met, did you all meet the president yesterday? Yeah. How was it? <laughs> and you meet Michelle Obama tomorrow, right? Yeah. yeah. Wow, we get to be sandwiched in between the president and the first lady. We can't go wrong. <laughs> Um, so exciting to be here and so exciting to see all of you here because you are the ones that are making change, not only in your countries but around the world because you're setting the pace of change for the rest of us. So it's ex very exciting for us to be here and specifically on this panel because you have such an incredible panel here that are really thinking about how to have, what are ways you can have social change and how to be entrepreneurial in having social change. When we think about entrepreneurship, we largely only think about entrepreneurship in the business sector, but really there's entrepreneurship taking place in social change. And most of you are leading that, and our three panelists are leaders in that space. I hope you will be ready to ask questions. I'm only gonna ask a few questions, the rest of it is open to you. And I hope you'll be prepared to uh, participate in this dialogue, because it will very much be a dialogue. So let me just introduce the three speakers here really quickly. Um, first of all, my name is Sonal Shah. I am the executive director of the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University. Uh, prior to joining uh, the Beck Center at Georgetown, I was the uh, office, I ran the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation at the White House. Uh, next to me is, is Sipo Moyo. She's the Africa director for the One Campaign, uh, where she's been since 2010, and she has such an incredible background. For one, she represents One's global work across Africa. She has spent over 18 years uh, with development experience from the African Development Bank and the World Bank. Uh, she has led budget support initiatives. She has led country policy discussions on housing. She served on President Bush's Blue Ribbon Commission on Affordable Housing. She has a PhD in economics from Howard University in Washington, D.C. Yay! <laughs> and. She has lived in over 10 countries on three continents and traveled to more countries than I can count. So uh, welcome, Sipo Moyo. Thank you so much. Thank you for that kind. So Sipo, let me just start with you and then I'll introduce everybody along the way. Talk to, tell us a little bit about why you left the development institutions to actually really go into activism and what is it that focused you on moving to the One Campaign? That's a really great question. You know, I think what it is, is I, I had spent 18 years, like you said, you know, between the World Bank, the African Development Bank, and the UN. And my sense was that I had no idea what civil society does, you know, or how civil society works, really. My, um, all I knew about civil society was that, particularly in Africa, civil society was on a collision course with governments. And um, I wanted to really find out how I can be in civil society and not be in a collision course, but in a way uh, just hold governments accountable and uh, perhaps convince them that it is a good thing for them to be accountable. So, and I, I'm, I'm sort of glad that I made that transition. At one, we focus on holding uh, leaders to account and um, in a sense, you know, influencing policy change. That's really important for us. And the difference between what I did before and what I do now is that in my previous, uh, in my previous life or in my previous, previous incarnations, um, my job was to, in a sense, approve projects, fund projects, and supervise projects. You know, so it was about building roads, highways, bridges, schools, hospitals, and so on. And when you do that, you know the impact. You know exactly how many people are going to benefit from it, how many trucks are going to drive on that road, how many farmers' projects is going to go through that infrastructure. Uh, but with changing policy, I think the impact is that, much, that many times greater. Mm. Because uh, if you build a school, you know how many kids are going to go there. But if you change an education policy, you've changed the lives of everybody in that country, or even if you multilateralize it even better on the continent. If you change a health policy, you've changed that many more lives you know, than if you just um, built a hospital. And it's great. Somebody has to build the hospitals, but it's about bringing everything together and making a real difference. So that's the, that's the difference I think that uh, you know, activism uh, and, you know, and uh, campaigning work really does, is changing policies uh, has, in a sense, uh, a greater impact you know, uh, and is very complementary to, to the other work that uh, you know, development partners are doing in terms of actually building the infrastructure, providing the services, and so on. I hope we can dig into that a little bit more because I think that's an important uh, point that you make there. 
next to Sipo is uh, Alain Cheruisa, and I'm going to say it pro I said it wrong, didn't I? <laughs> say it right. Alain Cheruisa, yeah. Yes. That's right. uh, but he goes by Alesh. Yeah. Because he is a hip hop artist. And that is what you need to remember. Do not remember anything else I said. Um, he is a hip hop artist. He has. Uh, he's from the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's a Washington Fellow. He has, uh, he's part of the civic leadership track. He's worked for five years, uh, over five years, with youth focusing on arts as a tool for activism, civic action, and positive social change. So, and he's a founder and the artistic director of Mental Engage, focused on empowering hip hop artists with civic and human rights knowledge, social awareness, and so social awareness programs. As I mentioned, he is a hip hop artist. He speaks four languages, French, English, Kiswahili, and Lingala. He has a BS in international monetary science, uh, economics uh, sciences, and you can ask him why he's chosen to go from economics to hip hop artists, which is a good question. <laughs> and he's creating the Lumbamba Civic and Cultural Center to empower youth in civic engagement, human rights, and artistic skills. Um, so, Alesh, tell us a little bit about why you've chosen not only to, to go to, to use hip-hop, but how do you use hip-hop as a civic engagement tool and why you think it's important? Yeah, um, actually, uh, as many youngsters here, many folks from different countries might know, um, hip-hop is a universal language, as we used to say, because uh, we're from different countries here, and. We, we have different type of, uh, types of music in our different countries. But I think if there is something in common that we can find from the Congo to, to Zimbabwe to China to whatever, it's hip hop, it's that, that, that type of music that really uh, gathers so many youngsters. And I, I'm from the third city of the Congo, which is called Kisangani. And in that city, hip hop has a great influence in, in youngsters. And I think that uh, has, uh, we, can, we can know, as we know, hip hop uh, as a music, but also has a culture touches so many souls. And you know, like uh, my friend Nancy Lazaro, who's from Tanzania, used to say, people might forget what you did they might forget what you said, but they will not forget how you made them feel. You know what I mean? And I think that hip hop touches souls. And originally hip hop music or hip hop culture is about addressing social issues. Today we know commercial hip hop and stuff, but the roots of hip hop were about to, to address social issues. That's why I choose I chose to, to be part of those artists who take the risk to use something that gathers so many youngsters, not to, to, to make them feel silly, like uh, talking about topics that doesn't make sense, like violence or drugs or what, but to use that same tool to change, to positively change the society. Because most of us here, we, we have the picture of hip hop music of, or of rap music that we have in our head is that picture of commercial hip hop. Mm. And I think that in Africa, we have so many problems, so many challenges that we might consider like our priorities. And our hip hop, I think that our hip hop music should be different and address local problems and real problems that make sense to every, every member of our communities. So how many of you like hip hop? Oh, so you have an audience here already. Uh, yeah, I've got uh, some fans see? right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say he's going to perform afterwards, but then we might not have a panel. <laughs> <laughs> With, uh, but I hope you'll go into that a little bit more as to what you uh, how, we, how hip hop can also help with greater social change, and especially from where you come from in, yeah. uh, in Democratic Republic of Congo. So that would be great as we yeah. move forward. Sure. Um, at the end here, we've got Bill Carter, uh, who is just an incredible person. If you all haven't met him, I hope you'll take the time to meet him also. Uh, he's the Ashoka Africa Diamond Leader, director of Ashoka Africa, which is the largest network of social entrepreneurs around the world. Uh, for those of you that don't know about it, I hope you'll take the time to learn about Ashoka, because 
they're doing a lot of great work around the world. Um, he served on Ashoka's international board for 29 years, uh, has selected Ashoka Fellows around the world. He guides the overall strategy for Africa, uh, and they support changemaker schools across Africa. Uh, more inter you know, what's interesting about Bill is he used to work at EPA with Bill Drayton, who created Ashoka, and then decided uh, while they were working in the government in this fairly decent job to then say, we're gonna go create an organization that, that has the potential to, do, to invest in young people who are changing the world. So I uh, hope you'll talk a little bit about that, Bill, sure. and, and welcome to this event, and thank you for coming here, because I think it'd be great to hear about how you've made that change. How did you go from being on the board of Ashoka to running uh, the Africa program, and why? Why is it important to you? Well, I, um, uh, I had worked, uh, uh, and my work in Africa began in the early 90s, uh, when I began interviewing fellows <clears throat> for Ashoka fellowships and all across the continent. And, um, and, and I came to feel that this was Africa's moment and that Africa was going to be the most powerful demographically, ultimately economically continent in the world by the end of this century. And that every one of you are at this pivot point, at this fulcrum, which is really gonna define the way the world works <clears throat> because Africa is gonna dictate um, very much of what the world does over the next century. Not, people don't understand that now. Uh, it's still because people are still <clears throat> focused on countries whose demographics are slightly ahead but will decline uh, in advance of Africa's. But <clears throat> and so I thought that it was really time to begin to work particularly with young people in Africa and um, to work with our Ashoka Fellows, System Changing Social Entrepreneurs, with Youth Venturers. We've just launched a program um, called Changemaker Schools. Um, and, we and, and we're gonna be rolling out over the next uh, several years, uh, essentially a uh, sort of a, from primary school, secondary school, right through to university, everyone a change maker, um, a set of initiatives that we're looking to partner and collaborate with people on all across Africa. So I just, and, and it, all of you under, I think all of you already know what I am talking about. All of you have that power. All of, and, and you have that vision and you understand the power of an everyone a change maker world and how, how important that is for Africa, particularly for Africa and particularly now to set the foundation for your children and your children's children. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks. So, Sipo, I'm going to come back to you for a second because I think, um, you know, you, you talked a little bit about uh, policy and why policy change matters. You, I know the One Campaign works with young people around the world on a regular basis to get to policy change. Um, tell us a little bit about how you're seeing activism change and what are the tools and the technologies that people are using and why people are getting involved now. Mm -hmm. Why has the momentum grown and what are you seeing? Great. First of all, I think that... Um, particularly in Africa, uh, citizens are looking, are beginning to look more and more to civil society uh, to, change, uh, to change the world, to change society, to change uh, the way government you know, works. Uh, I think there's an increasing responsibility um, upon civil society to, to, to really lead the way in terms of uh, you know, achieving development. So that's, that's a really huge sort of shifted mindset. And then the second thing I think is that um, increasingly there is a space for civil society to collaborate, uh, not only with you know with the, with the citizens you know who are really sort of part of the greater civil society, but also to collaborate with private sector, to collaborate with government, uh, you know, because the challenges are so immense that really no single you know um, group or entity or you know a, a, a part of society can actually make a difference on its own. So collaboration has become really important. For us at the One Campaign, um, increasingly we're relying on social media. Increasingly we're relying on the new technology to engage, uh, to engage uh, citizens. Uh, and it's very important for the work that we do, that we do engage citizens. It, on the African continent, we have almost over 2.5 million uh, members. Uh, you know, in, for the whole organization, we have over 6 million members. Uh, and this is really important for credibility and for, in a sense, fact-based activism. Uh, we, 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 you know, we run surveys, we find out what is important to the citizens, uh, and recently, of course, we did the, uh, the Do Agree campaign, 
uh, which uh, you know, in a sense, has been you know um, uh, a great success uh, because we got over two million African citizens to sign on to this campaign. Um, using new technology, you know, we reach them by email. In Africa, particularly, we reach them on SMS. Uh, this is the short message. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you guys know it better. So we we, we reach them uh, through SMS, uh, and it's been very interesting. Just you know, engaging uh, African citizens because, in a way, we're getting our direction from them. They're telling us what is important and what really needs to be done. And then in terms of how we work with governments, what we do, uh, because we don't want to increase the burden on government. You know, government's work is hard enough. Uh, so what we do is we monitor their commitments. And we simply go back to them and said, look, you made this promise. Uh, isn't it time you kept it? You know, so we're not asking for anything new. We're not putting new burdens on government. We're simply asking them to keep their commitment, and that's really important. And so the way the Do Agree campaign worked you know, was such, in a sense, uh, a, a great example of you know, the grassroots mobilization, working with the citizens, hearing from them what is important, holding governments to account, and then multilateralizing that. It's a mouthful, but basically that means scaling that to the continent. So you're working at the country level, but then you're also scaling it to the continent. And uh, you know, the great outcome of that was that three weeks ago when the African leaders met in Malabo, uh, Equatorial Guinea for the EU summit, they actually signed a strong declaration for uh, agriculture, recommitting themselves to investing in agriculture. And another key component of that, of course, is civil society working together. That's really key. When civil society works together, uh, there's nothing more powerful. And in this particular case, we had 120 uh, civil society organizations in Africa who signed 10 joint policy recommendations that were submitted to the African leaders, of which they actually took on 80% of those recommendations. So it's really about collaboration, and um, I think we need to fine tune those skills and um, uh, build on that model, where we're partnering with civil society, we're partnering with um, citizens and getting their views and voices heard, and we're holding leaders to account. That's great. Now how many, all of you use SMS? Raise your hands. <laughs> how many of you use Twitter? How many on email? <laughs> I thought I would just ask because it's the old tried immersion. <laughs> well, what's interesting is that everyone in this room may be on email, but the average African on the street actually is on SMS more than on yeah, email. There's I agree 700, the 700 million, uh, you know, cell phones in Africa. Yeah. So. I agree with you. Yeah, uh, Go ahead. And, and I just wanted to make so to make a point about this the importance of technology of social media. I think that it allows people to network so easily. And nowadays, one of the greatest benefits of those social medias uh, in Africa is that th we've assisted to the birth of many e-activists, online activists who, who, who are spreading messages according to the community's challenges you know, through the internet. And I think that now it's really difficult for any government or any political authority to, to shut their voices off. And that's one of, one of the most important things, because if those activists were only doing their, their work through um, traditional media, such as TV, or, uh, TV stations, radio stations, or newspaper, it's more easy to track them and to, to put barriers on their work. But I think that it's, a, it's a, very st a very great step which has been made by, by using the technology in the activism work. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I think technology has certainly helped people have access to more information also, yeah. and the ability to yeah. not only hold governments more accountable, yeah. to, but then to be able to ask what you can do in your own yeah, communities sure. and how to do that. Um, Bill, you're investing in social entrepreneurs across Africa. What are you seeing? What are trends you're seeing? What are the changes you've seen in the last 10, 15 years? I think uh, one, of the, one of the biggest is that Africa is now confronting the, uh, its shift uh, from rural to urban areas. And so we're seeing more and more social entrepreneurs 
working at the, on, at, in the peri-urban and peripheral areas of the large cities, um, developing, um, you know, uh, people like Ingrid Monroe with J Johnny Bora, um, who, are, who, are, who are essentially creating a whole range of services, mobilizing people living in cities uh, to deal with the influx of, of more citizens coming in, developing, you know, s essentially suites of services, financial services, um, access to education, access to health, access to energy. And so I think increasingly the, uh, the social entrepreneurs that we're seeing are people who are cross-sectoral and as, as, you know, as, as Sifo pointed out, the, 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 the era of the solo practitioner is over. Um, this is the team of teams world uh, that we're working in now. The, the, the quicker you can get into team of teams world, the quicker you can create teams that are based on and interact based on empathy-based ethics because there, you're, you're not playing in a world where there are rules. You're, you're creating the new, you're creating new protocols in which this world gonna, is gonna function in Africa. So I, it, what we're seeing in, in, uh, is in part a response to, the, to, the, to, the, to quite a number of people moving into urban areas. Another thing that we've seen is Africans really beginning to take, and as, as you were just talking about, Alain, the, um, the ability of technology to leapfrog um, and essentially put, power in the hands of citizens all over Africa. You know, the ability to essentially access, I mean, we've just seen enormous uh, increases in the number of really creative new social ideas coming out of, out of uh, social entrepreneurs coming out of Africa, uh, is spurred in part by the, the, the access that you're talking about, to SMS technology. Uh, and that's been really important. And we're also seeing Africans really re-examining in a very fundamental way, which is very interesting, the issue of the, relink, the, the, the links between agriculture, for example, and nourishment, and whether their communities are being fully nourished and how, and, whether, and where they aren't, and what the roles of young people should be in this. We're seeing more social entrepreneurs working on that, and the role of elders in this process. So there are any, and so there are any, it, it, the, the interesting thing is that the e-commerce, the e this, this e-idea that you can put power in the hands of young people is also offering Africans just go across sectoral an opportunity to really, really re-examine <clears throat> sort of some of the fundamental challenges, health, wellness, access to nourishment, uh, access to clean water, um, that, um, that they didn't really have the power to, they didn't have that power themselves. And rather having, rather having gone through this long period that was so many of the societies that are working with Africa were pre-E for too long, right? And they developed programs and thoughts and habits of mind that were pre-E. And, but now you have in Africa a society that's really beginning to con confront its urbanization and its transition issues in a completely e, e era. Mm -hmm. And that just gives, that it just, it, so in some cases you just see disconnects, yeah. uh, cross-cultural disconnects in that, in that area, cross-sectoral disconnects. Uh, and and the, the, work of, the work that you all are doing in this area is really gonna be pivotal to making sure that Africa makes that transition much faster and much more successfully than um, some of the societies that have had to face that transition recently in, in the 20th century. So how many of you have questions? Ah, there we go, we'll start with questions. Is there a mic? I think we have some coming around on both sides. Can we start right here? There's a mic right behind you. And can you give us your name and where you're from? Um, thank you, uh, I'm Ivan Collinson from Mozambique. Okay. And my question is, um, do you see uh, social entrepreneurship as a response to incompetence and failure or inability of some of our governments in Africa, even in US? If, if, if not, what is the difference? Thank great, you. Great question. Uh, do one of you want to start with that? Or do you want to, uh, Sipo, do you want to, or why, Bill, why don't you start and then we'll. Sure, I, you know, I think that the, the social entrepreneurship um, really um, took off um, beginning in the, around 1980. It grew out of a realization that um, the citizen sector had been really mired. It hadn't been a rate of growth at all for hundreds of years, the business sector had. Um, but the citizen sector had been largely controlled by government and religious organizations. The rate of growth had been flat. Uh, and so economic growth had taken off. There had been no corresponding increase on the social side. And so you had all the dislocations that we're all familiar with in all of our societies. And the, it was like a big bang, right? It, it's just the, the explosion that took place and has now been sort of, you know, that, that universe that's been expanding, that's expanding all over Africa, 
is touching all the countries in the world. And it's, it is, it's the understanding, right, that a citizen can have a system changing a new idea and, and change their society. A citizen can take action, put together a team of people and address, and a citizen can be as entrepreneurial in society as a business entrepreneur can be in business. And in, and in fact, the thing that we were focused on beginning in 1980, which has played out, is that the business sector has become more socially conscious, the citizen sector has become a lot more entrepreneurial. We're at that, we're at that point of synthesis now, and it's reflecting its, it's, it's not, it isn't anybody's fault or anything, it's in, in, in terms of history, this, is, this was the time when social entrepreneurship stood up and it came along at a very fortuitous time, I think, for Africa. And Alesh, why don't you add to that a little bit as to why did you, for yourself, believe that it was important from being a hip-hop artist to also participating in social change? Yeah, for me it was really important because I think that social entrepreneurship is a response to a system failure. And from where I come, in my country, the DRC, I think that we have so many issues which are caused by that, that system. I mean, the, the governmental failure, the, uh, all those ministries who are in charge of social change, of employment, youth employment, uh, uh, all those sectors. I, I think that they, the, the problem for us came when we, we, we start trying to resolve all the problems in the traditional way. So I think that our, our youngsters, our communities, uh, left all the charge to the government who was, supposed to, who was supposed to resolve the social issues by traditional ways. I mean, like providing formal jobs, uh, uh, educating uh, uh, in the formal education system that means in school bench uh, on school benches and stuff and the society really forgot the informal part of the education uh, so for me it was really innovative because uh, most of people trying to tackle um, uh, the social problems in the formal way, were, fa uh, were falling down because, you know, I mean, it was so enormous. The problem was so huge that uh, people didn't know uh, where to start and where to end. So I think that uh, it's really important. It was really important to me to, to sensitize youngsters about how solution can come when we have uh, youngsters getting involved and trying to find informal ways to resolve problems. And the only mean that could do that was that tool, that music, uh, which allows youngsters to, to be gathered first, and then after, through that mean, to, to take time to call other experts, like uh, I can give an example of Bill or or somebody else for Stanley Nikula and stuff to, to come and explain people how to get engaged in this field, how to get engaged in that field. I, I might not have all the expertise because I'm more artistic, but with my network, because I, I travel around the world and I meet different people, I, I use my networks you know, to empower those youngsters. And I couldn't do it if I was not doing hip hop music. And I think that uh, all of us here in this room uh, gotta try to look for a way to resolve problems with the assets that we have. Great. Um, I think we have a question on this side. <laughs> right here in the middle. Or actually, right here in the front, sorry, right here. Apologies. Again, can you give us your name and where you're from, if you don't mind? Good morning, my name is Zon Zero. I'm from Cameroon. My question, goes to, my, my question goes to CIFO. Actually, I would like to know how you ensure that the SMS you send are actually received. For instance, like the people, the telephone numbers are active. And also, these SMS you send, do, you, do your recipients send back feedback through SMS? Thank you. 
people? Great. Should I take this Please. right away? Okay. Good. So, very good questions, actually. Uh, we do work with phone companies and, you know, uh, te telecommunication companies like, you know, MTN, uh, Vodacom, and so on. So, we work with them. And we also get the databases, current databases, from uh, the companies. Um, and, you know, sometimes we also get the numbers from, directly from our members who are on email and so on. And the way we know that they have received them is because, well, not everybody responds, but I think we have a relatively high response rate, um, like above average. I'm sorry, I can't give you that number right now because I don't remember it, but we have a very high response rate. Um, and so they respond. Uh, and if it's a survey, they'll answer what the issues are. Uh, if it's, you know, uh, a campaign, they will sign on to the campaign and say they, you know, they agree with the campaign and they'll sign, uh, you know, like, you know uh, against the petition. Um, and uh, so we know from the results, for example, we did a collaboration with young African artists um, and, uh, you know, from Alain's country, we worked with Fali Puba, and from Nigeria, we worked with Diba, and, you know, and so on. I don't know, how many of you have heard of coconut chocolate? Um, <laughs> okay, some people, that's good, you know, maybe we should play it here. So, you know, the music collaboration uh, was great. You know, we had 19 artists from 11 countries singing in 10, con in 10 languages and the, on one message, which was do agree. And so we know from the downloads, you know, uh, you know, how many people have actually seen that SMS and downloaded the song. Uh, we know from the number of petition signers, you know, which was 2.2 .2 million people signed the petition. So we know that there is, you know, people, the message is getting across uh, and, and, and it's, you know, in a sense, it's, uh, it's, it's achieving the results that we're looking for. So, and we found that actually in Africa, SMS is the most reliable way to reach the majority of African citizens, which is why our partnership with the telecommunications companies is very important. And I want to point out that this is a good example of a collaboration with private sector. Because what it means for private sector is that they're doing well while they're doing good. You know, so they're still making profit, but they're also contributing to an important social cause, as this one. Yeah. And I, I think, I think uh, just to only add to that, I think the technology is only going to get better to help us track better. But for right now, I think this, you take correlations as well as you can in, yeah. terms, of yeah. in, in terms of figuring out what's, what's the best use. Absolutely. We have a question here, right up front. Right, in the, right there, perfect. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> Again, your name and uh, where you're from. My name is Nancy Azara, and I am from Tanzania. My question goes to the hip hop artists. And um, we've seen many hip hop artists who are singing songs that promote negative images about women and girls. And these can only um, widen the gap of gender inequality. What are your thoughts on this? Because we need positive messages and we need gender equality to be a reality. Thank you. Oh wow, oh, I, I can see that it's a, <laughs> it's a serious issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I might acknowledge that the hip hop stereotype, especially in rap, is that, yeah, we, we wanna get, we rappers <coughs> wanna get the, the street credit, what we call street credit, by being violent in our speeches, in our lyrics, by being disrespectful, especially disrespectful towards women. And you can see that through the videos, the type of videos that we hip hop artists make. Uh, I personally don't agree. I, I'm not part of those artists. And I think, I really think that women deserve another treatment, a respectful treatment. That's even why with my association, we, we've launched in March uh, an album called Get Loud, w which gathered 20, 22 different uh, musicians from five different cities of the Congo. Get Loud, in fact, is, a, is, a, is an album dedicated to women and girls, which tackles different challenges that women face uh, in the Congo in their daily life going from the access to education from that, uh, for that little girl, uh, going, with, uh, going to, to, 
to the use of uh, uh, rapes as a weapon. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm part of those artists. This reminds me yesterday, President Obama right here, who said uh, there are some traditions, because I, I think this is a part of the hip hop tradition. There are some bad traditions that we gotta ban, that we have to ban. And, yeah, I, 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 I'm really sorry. I, I can apologize for other hip hop artists, but I think that the most we have a, a conscientious artist in that field, the most people who are making it, who are reaching a high level, give another type of message to younger generation, the better the picture of hip hop music will be in the future. I think it's a permanent work. We, I'm not supposed to say I have the, the, the answer right here, but I think we can start to work on it now to get better results in five or 10 years. Okay. Question back here. Clement from Madagascar. My question is to all of you. How would you promote activism in developing countries where access to technology is still very limited and costly, and as more than half of the population still live with less than $2 per day? Thank you. Great question. Um, Sipo, do you want to take that, and then Bill, do you want to address some of that too? Sure. That would be great. Um, great question. Can you repeat like, that question? Because I'm not sure everybody heard it. Okay, so the question was, how do we use, how do we use activism in, in countries where technology is not as prevalent and the majority of people still live below a dollar a day. Something like that, yeah? Okay, great. So I think the first thing, you know, um, just from, from my experience is that it's really important to engage citizens. Uh, and by that I mean is hearing from them what their challenges and priorities are. So it's not about imposing an agenda on them, it's not about coming and telling them what's important, it's about hearing from them what is important. And that has nothing to do with a dollar a day or not. You know, uh, If something is important to them, they will get engaged. And yes, while you know, majority of African citizens do have a basic cell phone on them, you're right, there are areas on the continent that are really hard to reach. To reach. And so that's where the partnership really comes in, because if civil society is working together, uh, in a, you, know, you have partners in every country who can reach the most hard to reach areas, you know, remote areas, you know, the most you know, uh, uh, back of beyond uh, you know, uh, uh, regions of the country, you know, and so on. So you can reach people in that way. But I think the most important thing is really uh, making sure that the priorities belong to them because the challenges are felt by them really, you know, I dealt with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think I've sort of answered that question because, so it's SMS, uh, it's radio, it's actually going out there, engaging them, and most importantly, it's hearing from them what, what, what matters to them and, you know, dealing with that and then promoting, uh, you know, the work and that. And it has to be fact-based. Uh, you know, we, we, we now like to call ourselves factivists because you know, our activism is fact-based, it's you know, research-driven, uh, it's data-driven, um, and that's really important. So. Yeah, uh, I'd also want to add something, or uh, try to give one of the partners that we can find, even in areas where, where technology does not exist, because we find uh, such areas in different countries in Africa. I think one of the partners that we should always think about are the faith-based communities. Because I, I know that in Africa we are so spiritual. No matter what our religion is, but I bet in each village, even where you cannot find electricity, you can find a church. And I think that this is a partner that most of us have learned a lot about, about this partnership with uh, the faith-based community at Tulane University uh, in Louisiana where I attended my, my six weeks training. Today I think that it's really important in the community problems to also involve not only international organizations, not only 
um, those, uh, uh, I mean, the government or local or uh, other local organization, but also to think about the, uh, the faith-based uh, communities, because I think they're one of those organizations which has a very powerful influence on people's views in Africa. Bill, as you think about finding out social entrepreneurs around Africa, like how do you think about kind of making sure all communities are represented and you're not just going to the uh, popular ones, but you can get out to the communities where, where it's getting hard to get access? Yeah, you know, I, um, w one, of the, uh, w one of the issues are, are the, the technology brings is um, for, for, most, for, most, uh, for most people in Africa, particularly in remote, remote areas, the question is if you're gonna make an investment in solar or, or you're gonna make an, in, or it, that's a capital investment. And so you really have to know that that technology is gonna work, right? Uh, and so building the, and so what we're seeing is a number of social entrepreneurs now that are bringing the technology, the, the ability to actually fix solar, you know, because solar, you know, solar works and then it doesn't. And if it doesn't work, then it doesn't. Then your capital investment's wiped out. And if you've made it, it's a very significant investment for a family or a community. And so we're seeing more um, social entrepreneurs now stepping into the space and saying, "Hey, we've got to make sure the technology works. We've got to make sure we can share the technology." The the other thing I would say is that there's there's just no um, there, there's no alternative to really just hard work. Um, if you look at the Northern Rangelands Trust in Kenya, covers 25,000 square miles. Is run by a council of elders drawn from the pastoralists uh, in the area, um, and uh, it's it, and it's and it's and it's a well-functioning in and, and it's increasing in scope and size. It's providing livelihoods to uh, more than uh, more than a quarter million now, almost a half million pastoralists in that area, who are balancing the needs for their population, their education, and improving roles for women, and also improving their work for the environment. It's. The challenges, I think, well, we all face these challenges, but they're, they're extremely poignant in Africa because, again, it's, it's not a solo practitioner, it's not a team of teams, it's not one sector. You really have to be able to work in a cross-sectoral way and you have to work patiently to take people through the change in the habits of mind, whether it's a young person who can, dream, who can, hear, a, who can hear a lamp perform and then say, I can dream of doing this and then go out and do it, or taking a group of, of elders who, um, and basically taking them through the process of how do you become effective stewards in an, in an environment where the, the econ all the economics have been running negative for them for over, you know, for decades. How do you, when it turns around, how do you become an effective steward? Because you, the elders, have to balance, you have to be the cross-sectoral balancers. So I think it's, it's uh, we're seeing more work uh, uh, amongst uh, social entrepreneurs going on in, 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 in those areas, both in, in terms of making sure that the technology infrastructure is supported by a social infrastructure. Great. Um, I'm gonna try to take two questions at a time so we can answer them. But just to finish on, wrap up on this conversation, you know, many of you are gonna be leaders in your own places, and it's gonna be up to you to remember how you're gonna make sure communities are included in the conversation. And that's gonna be part of your own challenge, is to make sure that it's not just the usual suspects that you talk to, but that you're also talking to others in the community that may not be heard. But you're, it will be part of your responsibility to do that, and I think that's important. So I hope you take away from all three of these answers that there are multiple ways of getting to them, but make sure that as a leader, you're making sure you're hearing uh, multiple conversations. I'm gonna take two here, the front, right here in the front. Thank you very much. My name is Lucia Tieno. I come from Uganda. My question goes to Sifa. Uh, many times you see civil society organizations competing against each other as opposed to collaborating. They don't want to sh share information or because they're reporting a specific donor and they don't want the other to know they'll compete and not collaborate. What's your comment on that? Thank you. So, and can we just take one or here too? My name is Sarah M. Johnson. I'm from Liberia, and my question goes to Sipo. I think the problem in Africa is not about changing the policy. It's about implementing the policy because there are good policies that we have back in Africa. And considering your previous background, working with the World Bank on implementing projects, 
in Africa and now going into activism, what are some of the major challenges that you face because they are not the same? Great questions. Great. So yeah, these are two very tough questions, one on competing versus collaborating and the other on implementing versus uh, policy change. Okay, I'm really on the spot. So um, first question, what's my comment about you know, competing versus collaborating? It's, it's really what's my attitude. My attitude is I don't care who gets the credit, I just want the work to be done. And this is how I approach my friends on the continent. This is how I approach civil society. This is how I approach partners and everyone that I work with is I don't really care who gets the credit. Uh, let's agree on the issues that we agree on. Let, let's work together on what we agree on. Um, and the things that we don't agree on, you know, let's find other part, people who agree with us on those issues. So it's, for me, it's really about moving the needle forward uh, on issues uh, that affect the people that we care about. Uh, and it's about you know, not getting the credit, but getting the results. Uh, and I think that's a very helpful approach because you know, it's really about what's the one thing we can all agree on? You know, like what are the 10 points that we agree on? Let's come together on that. Forget the 150 other ones, just the 10 that we agree on. And you get sort of the coalition of the willing on those 10 points. Uh, and you come together. So it's, it's, for me, it's never about the credit. It's always about achieving the goal that we want to achieve and helping to change the lives of the people that we care about. So, um, that, and Sipa, when you, um, when you approach it that way, do you find that people come to the table that were originally competing with you? And how, do, how does that process work? It's incredible. Bit? It works like a charm. Uh, and, you know, and the thing is, <laughs> it, it, it's really incredible because I think it, it changes the mindset of everybody around the table. And everyone comes, then comes with the same approach about this is about a goal, this is about an objective, this is about an issue that is important. And that becomes the focus. It really becomes about, you know, how are we making a difference rather than who's going to get the credit for it. So, yeah. Um, and then another really tough question. Uh, from um, Sarah from Liberia. Um, the first thing I think, you know, the difference between, you know, working in the multilateral development agencies and being in civil society uh, is that um, I no longer write checks. You know, I used to be responsible for a portfolio close to a billion dollars. Um, I don't write checks anymore. Uh, you know, what I focus on is about changing policies. Uh, trying to help you know, uh, you know, to, to, to build the capacity of other civil society partners so that there's a critical mass of civil society. Uh, you know, and civil society is as broad as you've heard from my colleagues up here. Uh, we've worked very collaboratively, co collaboratively with uh, faith-based organizations, uh, you know, with young people, uh, you know, with uh, even private sector or social entrepreneurs and so on. So, it's really about you know, making, raising the awareness, first of all, uh, that there are commitments that have been made, uh, and then holding governments accountable on that, and then bringing in the expertise of those who are able to help with actually moving the needle forward in terms of the implementation. Uh, and the agriculture campaign is such a great example, sorry to sound like a broken record, uh, but it's such a great example because it started from the grassroots. It was the citizens who said, this is important to us. And then it was them that actually began to put the pressure. Uh, and then we began to have the conversations with governments and say, you know what, what's good for the citizens is good for the government. Uh, because now it's really about creating jobs. I'll tell you what we know about agriculture. 70% of our people rely on agriculture for their livelihood. Uh, over 30% of Africa's GDP comes from agriculture. In terms of a multiplier effect, it is 11 times more effective at reducing extreme poverty than growth in any other sector, including mining, oil, and gas. So this is about creating jobs. We have 10 million young Africans who are joining the job market every single year. And this is the, greatest, the single greatest opportunity for creating inclusive growth on the African continent. And I think, I just think, that you know, the, 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 the penny has dropped. You know. uh, leaders are actually realizing that if they don't do something about agriculture, if they don't invest in agriculture in a way that grows or develops the entire value chain and creates what the international labor calls uh, decent jobs, if they don't do that, if they don't make the people who feed us you know, capable of feeding themselves, uh, you know, if they don't uh, broaden sort of the, the economic base uh, and the revenue base for the countries, 
we are going to have a big social problem in Africa. You know, we're going to have an implosion. Um, and this is something that we want, to, we all want to avoid. And you know, that's why I'm just blown away by all of you. I've spoken to about 50 of you between yesterday and today. And just hearing the amazing work that all of you are doing in, you know, in different areas of endeavor, uh, you know, really gives me a lot of hope that we can actually begin to change the way that government is run in Africa, uh, not just from the point of view of having you know, amazing policies, but making sure that they're implemented because all of us are beginning to hold our leaders to account. Uh, and like I said, increasingly, uh, you know, societies are looking up to civil society uh, to actually help to make a difference. So, How many of you are thinking about working in government or are working in government? I think that's an, this is a very important, you're a very important audience because as you all think about your roles within government, implementation of the policies that are set out will be very much a part of what you do and it's actually quite critical. So hopefully um, everything that you've said, Sipo, will be a part of the conversation as they leave. Uh, Bill, I just want to bring you in for a second. You know, you support a lot of individual social entrepreneurs in Africa. Mm -hmm. How do they collaborate or how do you, what do you see in terms of collaboration versus competition from the way you, Ashoka operates and, and what you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, it, it's, it's very clear now that um, collaboration, collaborative entrepreneurship is essentially um, the, the way to go. Um, that, you know, the, what, what we found with, with our own experience is uh, people who try to go it, by, go, go it alone uh, wind up with their organization sort of reaching a certain level, very often at a local level or maybe a regional level and can stalling out because they haven't aggressively looked, they haven't thought, they haven't designed it at the beginning what their relationship is gonna be between them and their partners and their networks. Um, if you look at, I mean, if you look at the most successful social entrepreneurs out there, people like Sylvia Bond in Zambia, Ian Craig in the Northern Rangelands Trust, um, John Ibora, um, you know, uh, Usahidi, these, these are organizations that are designed, that, that these are, that they are collaborative network based by design. And so I think that as you, as th that's the most important thing now is as, as you move forward, you're really thinking about how do we design, the, how do we design it so that we aren't just competing <laughs> with each other? How do we, how do we from the beginning, because if you don't do it, if you don't design, design it in from the beginning, then you tend to sort of lock into, you know, tough behavior patterns and then find yourself um, kind of, the, your, your, the, your ability to grow limited. So how do, you, how do you design in the kinds of collaboration? How do your insights, how are your insights influenced by the fact that that's the way you want to work? Who do you reach out to? Who are the other people based on empathy, based ethics, who are launching endeavors that are similar to yours? How can you collaborate? How can you build something larger? If you're thinking about that right from the beginning, I think you're gonna be a lot more likely to be successful whether you're in Africa or anywhere around the world. But that's, that is such a clear trend. Um, and, I, and I think it's gonna be the key, to, I mean, as Sifo has been talking about accountability here and the power of social media to, to translate that into accountability. It's, it's, and, it, and, it's, and it's exactly this form of collaboration, right? They, taking, when a, when a community realizes who it is and what its strength is and what its voice is, then the people, then the ideas that'll come out of that, that's, that take the, to take accountability to the next level, right? That, that, that's the fruit of collaboration, right? And that's, and, uh, and that's what the social entrepreneurs are, are uh, the, the most successful social entrepreneurs in Africa that we're seeing are doing. I'm gonna take two questions from this section and then we'll come back to this section. So uh, there's two in the middle if you, can if you can get the two there and then we'll come back. Uh, good morning, my name is Gillian, I'm from South Africa and I identify as a social activist. Um, I work very similar to you with young people looking at how do you use the creative arts as a tool. And one of the biggest challenges I found is that although sort of technology and the digital age help us do our work better and it's easier and it's cheaper to communicate with people, it also creates a culture of slacktivism where young people are okay with clicking like on Facebook or retweeting, but that is it. That is where their engagement stops. And I've been looking at how do you extend that engagement to go back to activism for what it really is? How do you get young people to come to a workshop on a Saturday to put up posters in the area to talk to other young people? And how do you get them to actually implement sort of social action projects where action is more important and they focus on the outcome? 
So uh, you spoke about sort of the SMS um, programs that you run, Sipo, and I find that um, those are the type of programs where people respond to you with an SMS, and I get many SMSs back from when I send out this, the general message, and I, I find that there's not enough to draw them in and to sort of bring the conversation to sort of entrepreneurship and how we use that for social action. Governments and businesses do not want to fund the arts. They do not want to fund young people working as artists, and they're not interested in how sort of young artists turn their passion into products that they can sell. So what are the options for, for funding those type of young people, and how do you deal with sort of this phenomenon of slacktivism? That's sort of a lot of the organizations, global organizations, are actually making it a lot worse because they do a lot of their activism through social media and through the internet. Great, thank you. There's multiple questions in that one question. <laughs> so we'll come back to that. Can we, um, go ahead, please. Thank you, my name is Mikaela Adisu and I'm from Ethiopia. Uh, my question is also related to the one which was just asked, but uh, on activism and particularly in using the ICT and the digital media, uh, how do you make sure that the agendas that you actually try to lobby for uh, will not be transformed into unintended actions or consequences such as for instance, cause, because you deal with some fluid issues and agenda in some countries, uh, how do you make sure that they are not transformed into unintended consequences such as leading to the Arab Spring and other effects? So how do you actually make sure that you protect this from happening in those areas? Thank you. These are, these are two great questions and I, you know, consistently uh, great questions. So the first one I think uh, very important, I think for all three of you, but just to really think about, and Alesh, maybe we can start with you, which is how do you go from people wanting to be supportive to actually doing something? And then uh, on, the, on, on the technology side, how do you go from beyond the like to actually actively participating, uh, not just passively part of participating? So how do we get to active engagement? And then the second one, really to think about, uh, you know, how do we answer these unintended consequences? You know, the, in, the good thing about information is you have access to it. The bad thing inf about information is everybody has access to it. And it has an impact on you. So how do you, how do you think about that in today's world? So, uh, Alesh, do you want to start with the first in terms of activation? As, as people come together, how do you actually actively get them to come together to do stuff? And Sipo, maybe you can take one from there, too. Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting question because uh, I'm also one of those people who, who use new technologies or social medias for, for, for activists. And I, uh, I'm also one of those who think that it's not enough to click on like. It's about going down in action after that like. That's why I think that it's really important to, to collaborate effectively with the, the community in bringing together, together people, especially, especially youngsters. We, we gotta reach that point where we go beyond the virtual world. And if it's an organization, for example, it's really important to, uh, after that, if you're fighting, for example, you're fighting for a cause. I remember in 2011, uh, there were a very controversial election in, in the Congo presidential election. And we started a project with, which was called Kimia Kaka, which means only peace because the main message was, we only want peace. And we start from the internet. You know, we, we explained our project and told to the youngsters, especially those from the eastern part of the Congo, who think that it's really important for us to, to run this project and to tackle the problem of cultivating the peace during that time, because it was, a, a very delicate time for us. And we saw so many, uh, through our uh, Facebook fan page, we saw so many likes. And then the, the, next step, uh, the next step was how to calm down, how to make a, a reflection session between us, how to come together, reflect together, but beyond that, 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 that virtual world. So we called in different cities, we, we organized clubs. We organized clubs 
youngsters came, we talked with them, we talked with artists, we got into recording songs, broadcasting the videos, and then making, uh, making events, making events that gathered the, those youngsters, and then we talked, we talked, we talked. The people, I, I mean, different artists who were there had, had different uh, influence on the youngsters. And at the end, our conclusion was that when we can, when we have that opportunity of gathering people in physics, after a, a, after a virtual broadcasted call for causes, it's really important to do it. So that's a way to, to come up with a, 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 concrete, a concrete action for youngsters. Because if, if we don't step up and, and propose youngsters to come together, propose community members to come together in physics and just limit our, our actions in pedagogical actions, I, I mean, our cause will be a failure. I don't know if, if you're satisfied uh, from the answer. Okay. Really? Good? OK, <laughs> I'm happy. Because I, 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 always, I always make sure, thank you. I always make sure that I, I, I really reach that point where I answer to your question and to your preoccupation. But your, your, your question was so tough. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it, it's something I, I really want all of you to, to, to get interacted with us and think about a lot of things, even after this hour. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's an honor for me. I, I see a lot of critical minds in here. And it's an honor for me, you know, to discuss about, uh, to discuss about some challenges. I will also have questions for you. Because now I can't, but I mean, after this hour, I will also ask you questions because I don't have answers to all the questions, to all the problems. Yeah, I, and I think, I think others should make a very important point, which is in many ways you're asking us questions and we're giving you answers, but recognize that we're also processing this information and it's an input as well as an output. So you're, you're also feeding in input as time goes on and, and we're assessing this and thinking about this as we move forward too. So. Uh, don't assume that this is just a one-way dialogue, even though it is right now. Uh, we hope you'll you'll continue to make this a two-way dialogue. So, Sipo, okay. do you want to take this on too? Because I think you your sure. activism is slightly different from how Alesh is doing it, which is bringing people in and actually getting them both the virtual and the physical together. Exactly. So, yes, the the really tough question about how to move people from just supporting or liking an action to actually doing and engaging something. And I think that takes me back to what I said earlier on. Uh, the starting point is really important. Um, it's, how, it's, it's how you engage the, 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 the citizens in the very first instance. The issues have to be their issues. So it, if in the first instance, this, this is an issue that they think is important, if this is an issue that they think, you know, they want to help pushing on, uh, then, it's not just about liking. And I'll give again an example. Um, in Uganda, they have the, 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 the you, you report and you reporters. It's really about you know, uh, uh, using te you know, the technology you know, uh, to, to, to deliver services. It's about making sure that you, know, you, don't, you, know, uh, you report on the stockouts, whether it's about vaccines or HIV and AIDS medications uh, and so on. You know, so you reporters are reporting on you know, what is available in the clinics and making sure that they are restocked before they run out uh, and so on. And then on the Do Agree campaign, for example, I, I, I want to go back to that in terms of how we're engaging people beyond just signing a petition. Um, what is interesting is that they're coming back to us. You know, these 2.2 million young Africans who have signed this petition are coming back to us. We've got so many young graduates who are every day, you know, coming back to us and saying, look, I've just graduated. How do I get access to credit? I really want to go into agriculture or I want to go into agribusiness. So it's, it's becoming a substantive conversation uh, because it's, this is about changing the lives of people. It's about creating jobs. It's about leaving people better off. And people are actually engaging. So they've, they've gone beyond signing a petition or liking it on Facebook. And they want to know how they can get access to credit, how they can get land. Uh, you know, how, can, how can they buy or lease or borrow land? Uh, you know, how can they move their produce to market? How can they get export licenses? How can they do better packaging, you know, to increase sort of, to add value to their, to their produce for those who are already in farming? 
So there's a lot of young people who are already engaged in that space. So, uh, and then on the second question, there was uh, the, the, the uh, unintended consequences. That was the question. That's a really good question because civil society in Africa is operating to a large extent in a very difficult space. Uh, it, it's not easy being in civil society in Africa. Let's, let's just put that up front right there. Uh, it's a very difficult environment to operate in and uh, you know, avoiding unintended consequences is really an important question. Um, and then again, I think it's really about you know, how do you engage the people? Where, where, where do the issues you know, uh, uh, originate from? Are they the people's issues? Uh, and then how do you involve you know, the, the policy makers? Uh, that's also important, you know, uh, and we shouldn't shy away from it. It is sometimes challenging. It's more difficult in some countries than in other countries. Uh, you know, some in, uh, in other countries, I think increasingly government is beginning to realize the importance uh, of engaging civil society and being non-threatened uh, by civil society, because potentially there is a real partnership there, you know, that can actually help to move the needle forward if they work together to, to achieve the common goal, which is, you know, to reduce poverty and make, you know, leave our people better off. So it's a very, you know, it's a very tricky question. Um, we don't have the answers for that. Uh, different countries are really have different challenges, uh, but it's important to always make sure that, you know, the, ch the issues belong to the people. Uh, they cannot be imposed. You know, the issues must be grassroots issues that come from the local uh, people, the local co communities and the local societies, and we're all working together for a common cause. And I think it's really important to highlight in these instances that there is a common agenda. There's, there's got to be something that, you know, civil society, you know, faith-based communities, uh, government, private sector, celebrities can agree on. There's got to be something you can agree on on certain particular issues, and it's good to focus on that. Um, and then just to go back to the other question, I wanted to say that, you know, uh, the reason it's important to engage everybody, I mean, you might be wondering why we're engaging, uh, you know, celebrities and artists and musicians. Uh, they have incredible influence. I mean, you know, Alesh, I don't know how many followers you have on Twitter, uh, but I can only imagine. You know, they, you know, and how many friends you have on Facebook. They have incredible influence. Um, and in the case of the Do A Grip campaign, when you have Debanj saying, you know, I'm changing my name from the Cocoa Master to the Cocoa Farmer, wow. You know, like that just moves, you know, a whole lot of young people to start thinking, if Debanj is gonna roll up his sleeves and be a farmer, I wanna be a farmer too, you know. So it's, it's all about collaboration and, um, you know, working with everybody to inspire uh, sort of. And I think you make two very important points, which is, you know, one, activism and especially civic activism isn't always the easy thing to do. And it's not, I, I will say it's not just in Africa, I think around the world actually the challenges are being faced, whether you're in the Middle East or whether you're in India or other places. Civic activism means you're challenging current authority. And that, that is a challenge, but collaboration has a way to get around that and to really think about new ways of bringing more people into the solutions. Uh, Bill, do you want to give take uh, the, I, I don't know which one you want to answer, but I particularly wanted to also get you in on the unintended consequences. Yeah, just, uh, just briefly on the activism, um, just, just two observations. One is that um, Ashoka has been doing some work the last several years uh, with, a, with a methodology that's developed that it transfers to youth serving organizations. We started piloting it in Kenya and we're finding that we're up to the thousands of youth ventures. The key to it is getting young people. Uh, it has to be their idea. If it's top down activism, you should care about AIDS, you should care about this, you care about that. That turns, I think, turns, I, our experience is if you give a young person the opportunity to de define what their new idea is, what their issue is, and to put together a team and actually go out and do it, and support them in that and have the community be involved, that's something that they will carry with them. So you can't take that away from them. They have now become, right, uh, an, a person who has the ability to express their own ideas. So I think we found that uh, to be a very helpful way of working with youth serving organizations. Uh, and, and, we're, and we're expanding that work um, uh, now rapidly. The other thing, I, the other initiative that we're seeing is I think for better or for worse, uh, young people are in schools. And so the Changemaker Schools Initiative that we have is really designed to look at where do you have schools where there are a very, very large proportion of kids who are change makers. And some of the initial work we've done, we're just electing the first 20 or so schools uh, now, and we're gonna be adding another uh, 10 or so from South Africa, hopefully by the uh, early, early September. And what we're finding 
is that the, that the schools that, are the, that have the highest proportion of change makers aren't the elite schools, right? Those, they're the schools where the change leader understands that there's a mission beyond the, the immediate mission of educating. There are schools that are very heavily based in empathy-based ethics, but because the kids can connect that mission of the school beyond the immediate mission of education, right, that there is a broader purpose. This school has a purpose of creating more schools like it to help kids who are developmentally disabled. This school has as its goal to demonstrate that the Kenyan uh, educational curriculum can be taught in poor areas. You can't just use it, use it as an excuse for non-performance. In other words, and those kids can see that, they know they're part of that, and then they are themselves, th that that school, that change leader has the power to articulate that vision for their school and transfers that, that power, right, that, th that agency to the young people to pursue their own, to, the, to pursue their own youth ventures, which comes back to the to the youth venture concept. So I think that there's a lot in agency. I think there's a lot in practice. There's a lot in finding the social entrepreneurs who are actually leading schools, who are really, and, and who are essentially incubating a, a new generation of social entrepreneurs as well. So I think I just, I would point to that and hope that we can, you know, in South Africa, that we, perhaps we can collaborate on the, you know, with some of the, up, the upcoming schools that'll be chosen in, in the change maker school process. So we're gonna take two rounds of rapid questions at this point because we're gonna run out of time. So one here, one right in the front, and then one right back there, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right here in the front. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. My name is Mohamed Zaradin Umar. I'm a civil servant working with the Bauchi State Government. And my question really goes to social media. Uh, we've understood perfectly that social media is a tool for promoting good governance, wider participation, collaboration, and an avenue for establishing an open government. Um, in a situation whereby you find yourself working with some government officials that don't want to be open, uh, it becomes a kind of threatening to yourself or your work, and um, what kind of um, uh, measures could be taken against such officers or gov top government officials that wouldn't want to be open, and um, considering the risk that w such employee will be facing by the time he wants to establish that open government using the social media. Thank you. Great question. Um, right here in the front. Okay. Uh, my name is Sahara Said Bila. I'm from Somalia. So my question is, I. I I agree the importance of working with which each other with civil society organizations, business entrepreneurs, and government. So my question is, who is responsible that they coordinate and collaborate with each other? Do we need an, uh, a coordination office or anyone in the, in the citizen can take that responsibility to make sure that they work with each other? It's a great question. And then one right back here. Thank you. My name is Aiden Bu from The Gambia and from Morgan State University. I had a question actually with regards to the social media issue. And I wanted to ask you whether, are we confusing social media and ICT as a tool for transparency in the way we work in governments, et cetera? And how do you ch face the ch address the challenges that we see now being faced in America and England in the first world where social media was embraced as a tool for transparency, et cetera, and now it's become this monster that's turning around, and there are more challenges in addressing them, particularly legally, when it comes to defamatory issues, libel issues, et cetera, and how do you use, looking at those issues, how are you now going to make sure that you're able to address them before they become a problem in Africa? Because we don't have the institutional endowments to address defamation, libel, et cetera, and you have a lot of people pretending to be you know, journalists, bloggers, et cetera, that use this vacuum to violate a lot of people's rights and, and protections as well. So how do you factor this into your activist work that you're doing? These are uh, incredibly good questions, and I think uh, the, la the both of your questions on social media, I would say, I think, are challenges that we're all still working through. I'm not sure there's a great, there's a full answer to this, but I'm gonna let um, Sipo, you wanna start with this, and then Bill, you might wanna take on a little bit of this, but this is, I think, important, uh, recognizing that social media is a, can be used as an open government tool, but is it itself an op open government tool? Does ICT have a role to play in thinking about open government? But then how do you manage to the downsides of that, which is if you don't actually have facts, mm -hmm. but the facts become 
the social media creates a fact as opposed to it being a fact, how do you manage to that? Like, you know, Sona, like you said, th these are really, you know, important and big questions that we probably don't have, you know, the right answers to, uh, you know, but I think, you know, uh, uh, clearly where, you know, uh, you know, facts are being created that are not facts, uh, you know, th I think there's issues of illegality and, you know, and that sort of thing. And I think, you know, crimes should just be prosecuted. If someone is committing a crime, you know, they probably should just be prosecuted. But it's a really fine line and it's not, it's not a, such a straightforward answer. It's also about working in a really di difficult environment where the work that, you know, the, that maybe bloggers are doing can be taken out of context or can be used against them just because it, uh, it's not favorable to, 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 to the authorities and so on. Really challenging questions, I would say, uh, but it's really, you know, I think we, we, we do need to be more careful. Uh, what is encouraging is that I think more and more uh, governments, particularly in Africa, are signing up to, to the Open Government Initiative. You know, Tanzania is a really great example. Uh, and so on, and you know, using uh, uh, using uh, ICT, uh, you know, to you know to to build sort of the accountability mechanisms, uh, you know, within uh, the, you know the governance structures. Uh, so th those are you know really key issues, and um, I think it will get better. And there's lessons to be learned uh, from what is happening in North America, as you, as you pointed out. Uh, there's lessons that can be learned from that. So yeah, and then there was the question about. Um, how do you do collaboration? Collaboration, sure collaboration. yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's really, it's on the ground, it's on the issues, you know, it's about coming together as partners who, are, you know, agree on a particular issue uh, or what we might call the coalition of the willing on a particular issue. Um, what you want to avoid, or certainly what, what, what we avoid is, is, is um, you know, signing too many, you know, MOUs and those kinds of things, they're not worth the paper they're written on. Uh, you know, it's just about the action, you know, just get down to the issue. If there's something that's important, work together on that uh, because you're gonna spend the rest of the partnership trying to, you know, interpret every word on the MOU. So, you know, MOUs for, for, for me don't work, you know, uh, the, 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 it's, it's really just about the action uh, and, getting on, rolling up our sleeves, and doing the work that needs to be done. Uh, but then again, you know, I think different uh, organizations have different experiences uh, and different preferences. But uh, in our case, we just find that, you know, um, tackling the issue and forging ahead uh, is more important uh, than, you know, signing uh, a piece of paper. So? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the areas where this comes up uh, has come up really um, um, very poignantly is the speak for issue, right? Because uh, in, particularly in the development world, uh, a, a lot of people acquired the habit of speaking for people uh, and, spe and speaking about them. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think one of the answers, I, mean, I, was, I was sort of mulling this as, as, as you were uh, asking the question, and the, the first fellow that came to mind for me was a guy, but uh, really a, a pair of social entrepreneurs, Harry Jonas and uh, Kabir Bhavagati, who created natural justice. Natural just, what is natural justice? Natural justice is an effort for people, um, uh, to, to, for, for, you know, for pastoralists, they, they started focusing on pastoralists in, in southern Africa. But essentially, how do you put your protocols out? How does that community put its protocols out and say, if you're going to engage with us, mining interests, whatever you are, government, economic development, here's how we roll. Here's how our culture works. Here's what our interests are. Because I think that the, 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 the real answer here is it, it, there aren't, the, the, our privacy everywhere in Africa has been rolled back so far, so fast. Um, that collectively uh, and, and individually all around the world, we're having to go back and essentially create n our own natural deal. We're having to go back now and create the protocols and processes by which we were going to engage with the world so that other people aren't speaking for us in, on our behalf, uh, about us. Uh, and, 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 and until we have that power, again, it gets back to the issue of do we, can we work as a solo practitioner, as a team of teams? In this world, you can't. If we're going to have, if that, if that's going to work for a pastoralist in Southern Africa, it's the same natural justice, right? It's that same process of protocol setting. If you want to have communities that are nourished, 
communities that nourish in Africa, you've got to have protocols. It's the same thing they're trying to struggle with in Europe and elsewhere. Our, our issues are all the same around the world. And I think, and it's that hope, it is, it is that, it, that is that that we are engaged in now. It's that that is the critical task for all, for all of us here, which is what are the protocols in our community that we're going to set, so by which we're going to be understood in our communities around the world, so people understand and can engage with us. And then people who want to engage with us in a, in a way that's not proper, not right, and, and that we can, we can spot that. And right now, we, we're just in the beginning stages of doing that work. So two questions, we'll take one from each of these uh, corners here in the middle. Uh, one here, right here, please. And then just really quickly before we go on to the next questions, in terms of open government and social media, we should separate those two slightly. Open government is when government can release its information and make it available to citizens so they can do something with it, whether it's researchers or others. Social media has an op is slightly more activism in terms of how do you get people activated as to what's happening, what they could read, what they could do. Uh, both of those things are not always the same things, and I think sometimes we, con we combine those two things and it's, it's not always the same. I do think the value of social media is that it has the potential to activate people, but it's also inherent upon all of us to read that information and ask the questions as to what am I reading and what's the data I'm looking at, as opposed to just believing it because it's an opinion that someone puts out there. Opinions are only opinions. It's your job to make sure you're asking the next set of questions. So one question here and one question right here, please. My name is Humphrey Anjoga from Uganda. My question is to all of you. In countries where activism has been labeled as rebels to government and has affected partnership with uh, the private sector, especially the local media, how can act activists regain trust of government to aid to, how can activists regain trust of government uh, in this uh, country so that we can have the, lo the civil activists uh, not compromise, I mean, so the civil activists, without compromising their mission and objectives, collaborate with the government as development partners. Great question. And right here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Yaya Jalu from Guinea. And my question goes to Mr. Bill Carter and Ashoka. Uh, we work with schools, primary schools in my country, Guinea. And we actually, we sometimes face to, to barriers because if you want to, bur to, to construct, to build schools, we have to get authorization from government mm. and how to deal with that. And my last question is, what's your impact in French speaking countries? Thank you. All right, can we take one more right here in the, in the, in the front right here? This is the last question for us, so sorry we're going to have to cut off because I think we're cutting off on time pretty soon. Thank you. My name is Naseyan from Kenya. Uh, my question, I have two questions, sorry, for being the last and have two questions. One is uh, for Sifo. Uh, you've been talking about activism and that the fact that you, uh, the, the things that you campaign is based on data and facts. So my question is, how do you relate this with a human face? How do you know this is creating a human face and a social change mm. instead of just data and the, the damage or the challenge of being abstract in terms of it's just data and it's just a click? How do you make that human and have a change? And the other thing is, we're talking about technology and creating social activism. And how do you reach that to isolated areas, which uh, most of the places are isolated or unreachable and in terms of their receiving SMSs and how do you, and most of the people there are illiterate. How do they interpret this data to achieve what you want to achieve? Thank you. Well, these are all tough questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like being on stage being asked tough questions. Um, so two major questions. One. Uh, one, definitely on collaboration. How do you work with government to get to outcomes? And what are ways to actually effectively work together with government on social activism? Is that, is that correct? And then the other question, uh, really looking at, uh, Bill, it was specifically to you in terms of uh, they're working with the schools in mm -hmm. Guinea. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you get authorization from the governments themselves as, as that's what's needed to make that happen? And I think this last question, very important also, which is 
how do you make sure that the human face is not lost in just the mm -hmm. abstract of data and technology, but that you incorporate the people into this, and then how do you get to the, the isolated areas? So the challenge for all of you is that we're running out of time. So yes. if you can do this in a rapid uh, format, that would be great. Now, Alesh, I wanna make sure, you, uh, I'm gonna have you go last on this because I think it's important that you do that, but if we can start with Sipo, uh, Bill, okay. and then Alesh, you close out for us. Okay, good. So the first question about uh, regaining trust with government, I think that's a really important question. And I do want to point out you know, in this forum that uh, it's not just about civil society uh, holding governments to account. Civil society has a responsibility to be accountable as well. It, that's really important. You know, it, being civil society is not a license to, you know, to just do as we wish. Uh, it's important for us to be accountable, and the question is, who are we accountable to? So that's something that really has to be considered. I'm not gonna go into depth, but it's really important. It's about being accountable equally uh, to, 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 to the people that we say we represent who are really the citizens. Uh, and I think that's a good way of just, it's a double-edged sword, it's a double-sided coin. Uh, it's about holding government to account, but also holding ourselves to account and agreeing to be held accountable. Uh, then on the second question um, about a human face, uh, I'll give the example of the Do Agree campaign, which is just closed out. We're actually just closing it out this week. And what we did, what we did, that's an example of how we operate on all our campaigns is we will go from country to country, crisscross the continent, uh, hold policy forums uh, that bring together all of the stakeholders. In the case of agriculture, you bring together the local farmers, you bring the former farmers associations, other civil society organizations who are interested in that issue, policy makers who are involved in making, uh, shaping agricultural policies, uh, you know, the, poly the, the opinion shapers and formers, the local artists, bring everybody together in a policy forum and have a real discussion about what are the challenges in this country, not in the next country, in this country, what are the challenges? What are the things that we think government can do better? What are the things that we think government is doing well? Uh, and then government can also say, this is a role we see for private sector. The farmers can also talk about how some of the policies have harmed them and not helped them. So it's really about bringing the, fo you know, the faces and the voices of the real people on the ground to a conversation that leads to sort of real priorities that everyone can agree on. So it's not, you know, it's going beyond just the, the social media. And I, we, we find that's a really important key is bringing people together because that also removes sort of the threatening element, you know, when people can sit together in the same room and argue and agree or disagree, uh, that's really important. Phil? Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the message for activists is you, that we just really have to raise our game. You know, I think we have to. I think that the um, that that pattern of, of confronting government with with uh, with problems uh, is a, is a historical one, traditional one. We know it in a lot, a lot of different societies. But I think that the, the the challenge now is for activists to become entrepreneurs to bring solutions um, and to start focusing on who are those people in government that they can work with. How can so you you, you don't just you don't government doesn't exist, right? You're people. Right, you've got to go find the people you can work with because once they find that they can work with, with civil society groups, they'll tell they you know they tell they tell their fellow ministers, their fellow governors, and suddenly governors find that they, they they are not in the headlines for being criticized for things. They can be part of solutions. So you just have to be strategic, right? You have to be entrepreneurial. The activism, I think, qua activism is just not a viable, isn't viable anymore. It just that just seems to be the lesson of the last thirty years, um, and and I just. Um, uh, I, I was just asked a particular question about uh, uh, Guinea. Um, Ashoka has been working in the Sahelian countries since the early 90s. We've got a very strong fellowship in Burkina Faso, Senegal, and Mali, and I'm happy to talk about that. You know, just at ex parte, yeah, it's like one-on-one -on -one communication. But uh, we're not in Guinea yet. Uh, would love to be, um, and um, and I I don't know the I don't I frankly don't have an answer to your question of how the, if the government stuck keeping people from creating uh, schools you know, how to respond to that. Just off the top of my head, I don't know. Right. Alesh. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to step on this point of activism and regaining the trust of the government. I first must mention something. Activism is not always about being against the government all the time. We're not supposed to be in a permanent confrontation with the government. So one... one 
Yeah, that's sure. I like applause. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, so one of the solutions that I can say, because we're not there just to point out all the time, we, we, we must acknowledge that our government has also some positive initiatives. And yeah, my proposition to you will be to, to get them involved, you know, from the conception. When you, when you have a project, uh, when you and your organization are planning to do something, because you're supposed to, to, to do things to positively impact on the community. And I'm not sure that your government will be against that initiative. So one of the things would be, yeah, to, to go towards to the government, because you have nothing to lose if the government says no. But in fact, try, give a try. And if it doesn't work, do it by yourself. Engage other stakeholders apart from the government. Our biggest, mistakes is, uh, our biggest mistake is always to, to think that the, the government is the one with the, the biggest share you know, of the charge of the community. But I think that the government has been said, there is no government. Go a government is made by people. And people mean community to me. And I think that all the stakeholders got to be responsible at the same level. And then if the government says no, okay, let's go toward other stakeholders and try to make things happen. So I think, first of all, let's give everybody here a round of applause because they Con Congratulations to all of you because it is your questions, it is what the questions that you ask are seriously the issues that you all are individually also grappling with. And as you see, we've also, we're also grappling with them. So this is not something we're gonna learn together as, the, as, the, as this moves forward. But I think the three things you can take away from here, one, collaboration matters. Not just collaboration amongst like-minded groups, but collaboration amongst others that might not be like-minded because everybody's trying to get to the same outcomes and the same goals. How do we bring them all together to do that? Two, while technology is important and there's an opportunity to leapfrog with technology, in itself, technology is not the answer. It requires working together in groups, putting a human face on this issue as opposed to just the technology itself, but rem remembering that that's a part of it. And then finally, the world is changing and it's rapidly changing and you are part of that change. What you see today as the elements of civil society, nonprofit, for-profit, government, all of those are starting to merge and how you choose to create the new ways of collaborating, new ways of working, that really is going to be up to you. You're gonna create the world that others are going to see. Don't just see the world as you see it today. So think about what you want to create, not what you see in front of you. And that's gonna be your responsibility. And we certainly look to you and to learn from you as you do that and move forward. See this group here as a group that helps you facilitate doing more of that and helps you get there. So thank you again and good luck with the rest of the program.